Well, welcome to Forest Hills Church Online. We're so glad that you can join us in this way. My name is Pastor Andrew, and uh, we want you to know that we're a church who loves God with our whole heart, that we seek to grow in our faith, and we hope to serve through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And uh, one of the ways we serve is uh, by uh, every summer in August, we host a, a, a theater intensive for a group of young adults who come and put together a show. That's what we have behind us here. This castle backdrop is uh, a set for the upcoming performance, which will be the first weekend in August if you are able to come and attend. Please do that. Um, and we are in the middle of a, uh, a series called Famous Conversions, just talking about famous Christian leaders from the past and how they came to encounter Jesus Christ. Um, it's been a, a fun series because each story is so vastly different, just as our stories are so different, and God works in different ways in our lives. So we're, today we're looking at the story of John Wesley himself, the founder of the Methodist movement. Um, maybe you know something about him. Maybe you know some famous quotes from Wesley. We're not focusing on those things necessarily. I'm just trying to focus on his conversion experience and how Jesus reached out to him. And so before we do that, we're going to take a look at our memory verse found in Romans 5, verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, combined with our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, we're going to turn our hearts and minds toward worship. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way when there ain't no way. Rises up from the empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who can work it all for good let me tell you about my Jesus who would take my cross to Calvary pay the price for all my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my Jesus. Ooh, he makes a way when there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. 
Let me tell you about my Jesus And let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah 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 Amen Amen Hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, and let my Jesus change your Paul explains to the church in Rome the way in which we are saved. It is a departure from what had been taught in the past, but just like in conversations when Jesus comes, he changes everything. Romans 10, 5 through 10. Moses writes about the righteousness that comes from the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith talks like this, don't, stay, don't say in your heart, who will go up into heaven, that is to bring Christ down? Or who will go down into the region below, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the message of faith that we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and in your heart you have the faith that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trusting with the heart leads to righteousness, and confessing with the mouth leads to salvation. Well, as we come to our prayer time, uh, we want to keep in mind a very important part of our con congregation, Dan and Gloria Hare, who many of you know and are, are friends with. Uh, as you know, Dan is a retired Methodist pastor who has been part of our congregation for the well, many, many years. Um, but the Hares have decided that they are relocating, and they're going to be moving down to Iowa to be closer with family and have a, their support system down there. Um, and so we're, we're certainly sad to lose them, and our church will, will not be quite the same without them. But we want to pray for them and let God's blessing go with them as they uh, head into this, this transition. Uh, so I just wanted to let, let you all know that the hairs will no longer be with us, at least here in body. But uh, I do know that they love this church, and they are going to be missing us as well. So we pray, I want to pray through a psalm, Psalm 16, which is a psalm of protection, uh, a psalm of, of have finding peace with God. And uh, as we do so, we keep the hairs in mind. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your protection. We thank you that we are able to take refuge in you. And we say that you are our God. Without you, Lord, we have nothing. We thank you, Lord, and we proclaim that we're not going to participate in the ways of hypocrites. We are not going to hurry after some other God. But Lord, you are our portion. You are our cup. You control our destiny. We thank you for your blessings, Lord. We thank you for the beauty of our homes and where we live. Lord, you bless us, you advise us. Even in the night, Lord, you instruct us. You speak to the very depths of our minds. So God, help us. Help us to always put you before us so that we will not stumble. Help us, Lord, so that our hearts can celebrate, that our mood may be joyous, that our whole body will be able to rest in safety because we know, Lord, that you will not abandon us. You will not let our lives go down into the grave. You won't let us be swallowed up. We thank you, God, that you teach us the way of life, that in your presence we can be truly happy, that beautiful things are always in your right hand and coming our way. Thank you, God, for your provision. Thank you, God for allowing us to be with you and find protection in you. 
In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, throughout this series, we've been delving into the stories of famous men and women of God. And we've been particularly looking at their conversions, those times when God met with them, those times when God broke into their lives and enacted a change, what we would call a transformation. We would say that when we, we, when we meet with Jesus, our lives will never be the same. I hope that you believe that Jesus changes lives. Um, in the past weeks here, we've looked at the story of the Apostle Paul. We looked at Augustine. Last week, we looked at a nun known as St. Teresa of Avila. And today, we consider someone who has a story of which you and I are actually a part. And that is uh, because we are part of a church that belongs to the Methodist denomination, a movement that was started by John Wesley. Much like St. Teresa, we're talking about a conversion story that happened to somebody who was already living their life in service to God, okay? And as we get into it, you're going to see how Wesley was changed by his conversion experience, changed by God reaching out to him. So remember that we have been saying that conversion begins with the truth. It begins with a new understanding that is revealed to us. And then that truth shows us the ugliness of our sin, and we become aware that something is not right in our lives. Something needs to change. And then knowing about this sin is a great opportunity for us because now through Jesus, we're able to enter into forgiveness. And we get to know what grace is. And this then spurs us onward with a new mission for life. Now, John Wesley grew up in the faith. His father was a pastor. His mother was devoted to bringing her children up in the Lord. And by today's standards, we we might even refer to her as, as downright militant in the way that she did her work with her children. Um, in Wesley's personal journals, there are included a few letters written by his mother. And those letters outline her thought process and her practice when it comes to raising children. And so his mother, Susanna, writes, In order to form the minds of children, the first thing to be done is to conquer their will and bring them into an observant temper. When the will of a child is totally subdued and it is brought to revere and stand in awe of the parents, then a great many childish follies and inadvertencies will be passed by. She says, self-will is the root of all sin and misery. She's right. Self-will is the root of all sin and misery. Uh, Susanna taught her children the Lord's Prayer as soon as they could talk. She taught them how to read right out of the book of Genesis, and she spent time with each child individually each evening, discipling them, talking to them about the Bible and about faith. So how could one raised under the tutelage of such a mother not be converted. How does that work? Well, by all accounts, John was a Christian and a powerful one at that. He followed in his father's footsteps and pursued a life in ministry. And while attending Oxford, John, along with his brother Charles and a few other friends, established what they called a holy club. A holy club. They would gather a few evenings a week to discuss scripture or classic works written by spiritual leaders. Uh, They resolved to help and support those who were in need. And in every way, their desire was to give their lives to God. So in fact, their lives became so peculiar, so strange, that other students came to make fun of them by calling them Methodists. And they called them Methodists because they lived out their faith with such purpose. And this purposefulness eventually led John to sail for America in order that he might bring the good news of the gospel to Native Americans. That was his goal. And so in 1735, he set out for Georgia to, uh, quote, live wholly to the glory of God. It was not an easy trip. 
and their, their ship was struck by many storms along the way. And this experience made John realize that he was actually afraid to die. He admits that he actually became ashamed of his unwillingness to die. So here was a man risking his life to preach the Word of God in a foreign country to a people that Wesley believed needed to hear the gospel, and yet he is at the same time ashamed of himself. The truth had caught up with him that Wesley feared death. Now, I would assume for most of us that, uh, uh, that if we were to be caught up in a terrible storm at sea, we might fear for our lives as well. And if someone like Wesley came up to us after the fact and told us of their own fear, I would assume we would, we would tend to offer an understanding reply. We would say something like, oh, I can't even imagine what you were going through. Or I, I would have been terrified too. Or maybe something like, you know, I, I'm sure you did the best you could. I don't think most of us would heap condemnation on such a person. Yet that's exactly what John felt. He felt condemned. His fear drove him to question his faith. After all, if he truly believed that he was saved by Jesus Christ, then what business did he have to be afraid of the end of his life? Moreover, in the midst of the storm, Wesley witnessed the reaction of a group of German believers. And actually, I'll just read right from his notes. This book is a, a copy of John Wesley's journals. Uh, and his account goes like this. At noon, our third storm began. At four, it was more violent than before. At seven, I went to the Germans. I had long before observed the great seriousness of their behavior, of their humility that they had given a continual proof by performing those servile offices for the other passengers, which none of the English would undertake, for which they desired and would receive no pay, saying it was good for their proud hearts, and their loving Savior had done more for them. Uh, but they had no complaint found in their mouth. In the midst of the psalm wherewith their service began, a sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, and covered the ship. So the Germans were having a little service, a little church service, even in the midst of the storm. And while their, when their service began, uh, the sea broke over and covered the ship and poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans calmly sang on. I asked one of them afterward, were you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. I asked, were not your women and children afraid? He replied mildly, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. And that statement, our women and children are not afraid to die, that statement haunted Wesley. He knew he should not fear. He knew perfect love casts out fear, yet he could not escape the truth that he was in fact, fearful. Wesley made it to Georgia, but overall his trip was a disaster, and he actually was hardly even given the chance to speak with any native Indians during his time there. And on his way back to England, facing again the, the specter of the sea, Wesley wrote in his journal, he says, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? I can talk well, nay, and believe myself while no danger is near, but let death look me in the face, and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say to die is gain. I have the sin of fear. Who will deliver me from this fear of death? Should I fight against it by thinking or by not thinking of it? How many of you know that fear is a sin. Fear is a sin because it dishonors God. Fear is a sin because it distrusts God. Fear is a sin because in it we insist that 
we should be in control. Wesley was a preacher, a Methodist, a man of God, but he was fearful. And I imagine he was a a, a type A personality. I imagine he was highly organized and regimented in, in the way that he conducted his life. I imagine he was comfortable being in control. In fact, a good friend of Wesley's, a man named Henry Moore, he, he stated that, uh, he, one, a quote from him is that he never saw a misplaced book or a scrap of paper lying about in Wesley's study, which was pretty funny to read in the midst of my own office. Um, it's been kind of documented that Wesley was always neatly dressed He had this sense of propriety and organization. Um, But that kind of thing goes out the window when one is surrendered to the mercy of the billowing ocean. So when all sense of control is taken from him, Wesley met with fear. What is it that you fear? What is it that takes away your sense of control? Wesley admits his fearfulness is sinful. He admits that it belies a full trust in God. Wesley knew the words of the Apostle John from 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. And there's the writer of Hebrews laying out what Jesus did for us in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children, that's us, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, also shared the same things in the same way. He did this to destroy the one who holds the power over death, the devil, by dying. Okay, he destroys the hold, the power, uh, uh, He destroys the devil who holds the power over death, and he does that by dying. It says, he set free those who were held in slavery their entire lives by their fear of death. So when Wesley asks, who will deliver me from this fear of death? Hopefully that sounds similar. That sounds familiar because it echoes the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? Paul says in Romans chapter 7, the same question. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? But note the difference in the answers of these two men. Okay, We have Wesley trying to retain his grasp of control of the situation, and he starts to analyze his fear. He wants to know how to fight against it. He asks, should I pursue this fear by mulling it over and, and rationally picking it apart until it is no more? Or or maybe I should avoid thinking about it and hope that through this concentrated effort that my fear will eventually dissipate. How do I handle my fear? To Wesley, it seemed that some sort of thought process would be integral in dismantling his fear. Right? Wesley wants to retain that control. What can I do? to dispel my fears. But now look at what Paul says. Paul's take on it in Romans 7, 24 and 25. He says, I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And Paul's answer, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who will deliver me? His answer is thanks be to God. Paul erupts into thanksgiving. And praise because he knows full well that the solution to his problem does not reside in himself. But it in fact comes from God alone. In Christ we are made free from sin and death and any kind of fear. No amount of thinking or rationalizing or strategizing will do it. We need Christ and Christ alone. So John Wesley continues, continues on his preaching ministry, though he wonders if he ought to hang it up. 
He wonders if he should do something else. He knows he is an unworthy vessel. He knows that he has no business telling others to trust in Jesus when he himself cannot seem to muster the same. In one conversation with his friend and mentor, a man named Peter Bowler, Wesley admitted his doubts about preaching. He asked Peter, he said, what can I preach? And Peter replied, preach faith till you have it. And then because you have it, you will preach faith. He said, do not hide in the earth the talent God has given you. So Wesley did continue on, expounding the promises found in God's Word. And then on Wednesday night in 1738, Wesley, feeling very heavy in heart, reluctantly attended a church meeting on Aldersgate Street. And during that gathering, someone was sharing from Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans. And the words read by Luther, they describe the change that God can work in the heart of those who believe in Christ. And in that moment, God reached out and touched John Wesley. Wesley writes, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John was able to join with Paul in his declaration, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For that is the solution to our fears. Thanks be to God. Now I want to notice a few things here. John Wesley, though a a pastor and church leader, still needed to be fully converted. He still needed that experience with Jesus. And he was blessed with a vision of his sin, his own fear of death that he knew was a problem, his own distrust in God's gift of salvation he came face to face with. And this sin he wrestled with for quite a while before he was led by Christ to a place of complete trust and forgiveness. These are all parts of conversion. And it goes to show that these these steps do not happen all at once. Our faith life is a journey, and God will lead, lead each of us in different ways and at different times. And so John Wesley's was not a journey from utter rejection of God to someone who dedicated their life to the gospel. Wesley was already committed to serving the Lord. But his heart had some areas that needed attention. And so we see God leading him slowly through the process of revealing his sin. And he strugg- of Wesley struggling with that sin. Of um, questioning his own use as a pastor. And finally, being fully redeemed. And fully set free from that sin. We know that Wesley was filled with a great vision and mission for God's kingdom. And he went on to establish the Methodist movement, which was characterized by a strong sense of holiness. A strong sense of doing away with sin, of living sinlessly. And we know that he was and he is used by God the world over to bring countless people into relationship with Him. There is one more thing to note from John Wesley's story, and that is um, his experience directly following his heart being strangely warmed. He had this, this touch from God. God reached out to John Wesley. But Wesley writes, it was not long before the enemy suggested This cannot be faith, for where is thy joy? If thou dost believe, why is there not a more sensible change? Wesley Wesley says, I answered, yet not I, that I know not, but this I know, I have now 
peace with God. My friends, we have an enemy. We have one who does not want faith to flourish, who wants to keep us in fear, who wants to keep us questioning the goodness of God. The enemy is going to keep pushing these questions. Oh, if you're saved, why not more results? Why aren't you better then? Why can't you achieve? Why do you feel so defeated? and deflated, and depressed. Can we learn a lesson from John Wesley this morning? And can we face the devil when he comes at us with a barrage of doubts and accusations? And can we say loudly and clearly the answer to your questions? I don't know. But I do know one thing. I know I have peace with God. I have peace with God. Can you claim that? In your heart and soul, can you claim peace with God? Can you claim aloud with your mouth, I have peace with God? I don't want you to lie. I don't want you to say it if it's not true. There are some of us listening for whom it is simply not true. We don't have a true and abiding peace. There are some of us, like John Wesley, who are stuck in fear, whatever it might be. Maybe you do not have the assurance of salvation. Maybe peace with God is not quite there. So I just want to encourage you today to come before the Lord to come before the Lord in Scripture. To take some time to read uh, what Paul writes in Romans. To say, take some time to come quietly before the Lord in prayer. Ask Him to fill you with His peace. Ask Him to kick fear to the curb so that Jesus can fully reign in your heart. And when he fully reigns in your heart, you can say to any doubt or any fear or any questioning from the devil, I have peace with God. There's one thing I do know. I have peace with God. Will you come to the Lord and know that peace today? I want to encourage you to do so. Amen. Well, as we close out our service, uh, I just want to uh, reiterate our need to be at peace with God and how it's only found in Jesus, only through Christ, which brings us to our memory verse for the week, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through our, His faithfulness, combined with our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Um, well, just as by way of a reminder, um, you can come and check out the, the performance of a theater intensive uh, coming up in uh, this first weekend in August. And uh, as well, next week we'll be talking about Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a great Baptist preacher who, uh, from London. Uh, so if you know anything about him, we are going to be talking about him, but again, focusing on his conversion experience. Um, which, little, little spoiler, it, it blends in very nicely with the story of John Wesley. So check, it, check out next week to see how that works out. But for now, let me leave you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may you know, deep down in your heart and soul, peace with God. Amen.